Hello and welcome to masterclass number 10, five ways to compost in situ. My name is Maura Gamble. I'm from the Permaculture Education Institute. And this masterclass is all about simple ways that you can do compost in and around your garden so that you're activating your soil all throughout. I hope you're going to enjoy it and get a lot out of it and really practical ideas that you can simply integrate into your garden, whether you're in an urban environment or a rural area, uh, whether you're in a temperate or a subtropical or tropical environment. I hope there's something in here that will really help you to activate your garden and, and grow better food. This masterclass series is brought to you by the Permaculture Education Institute. And this particular masterclass is also part of the Permaculture Educators, Educators Program. And today we're focusing on in situ compost. Uh, it's something that people have asked me a lot about over the years in terms of how to actually really activate the soil simply and easily and, and something that really doesn't take a huge amount of effort necessarily, something that you can do really quickly wherever you are. So, but before we talk about those methods, I thought it's really important just to touch base again on, on why compost. And you will find um, back in the in the um, the catalogue of the masterclasses previously a really um, full session on soil improvement that talks about a whole range of different things. And you'll get some more information there. Um, but today's session is really all about the in situ compost. So why compost? Essentially, it's the basis of a thriving garden with that that is the basis for healthy plants so it feeds the soil life improves soil structure and the compost too improves the water holding capacity so you can see from all different angles simply by focusing on improving and increasing the amount of compost and organic matter material that goes into your soil you're doing so much to actually improve the health of your health of your soil which then means better health for your plants which then in turn becomes healthier food for you and so it's really too about looking at how you can redivert all the various sorts of waste um, sort of so-called waste streams in your home and community and uh, within your garden um, to be making that back into food for the system which then in turn becomes food for you and why compost in situ? Well, essentially it makes really good design sense. It's about integrating compost throughout the garden. There are many different types of compost that you can set up in different areas. There might be small scale for the really micro areas and, and broader scale ones for the, for the large areas. And because you're doing compost in situ, you're always improving the soil in the gardens. It's not waiting for another application of compost to arrive. The soil is always being activated from these points and you move these points around the garden. So essentially it's less energy. You're not shoveling material from one part of your garden to another part. And this makes it accessible for a lot of people. I've talked to um, many people who have um, back injuries or because of their age, they're not able to, to wheelbarrow massive amounts of compost around their garden. And it's difficult. This way, it it's, makes it much more simpler and easy on your body because you are doing none of the heavy lifting of, of compost. You're just simply adding materials bit by bit and it, it composts right there where you need it. Um, and so what happens too, because there's a diversity of different sorts of compost systems, you're building a resilience into your system. If one compost system is not working really well at a point in time, you have another one that's happening and can keep on going. If one particular worm farm's full, you can go and put your materials somewhere else. So it gives you options and opportunities to make sure that there's always something happening within your garden system to be able to return your waste back into the soil. And really it's about learning from nature. I mean, in nature, there's this constant, if you think about how things work in a forest, there's a constant rippling of, of materials from the leaves and the fallen fruits and the branches back into the soil in and around where the plants are. So there's this constant feeding that's happening. Now, uh, I find in terms of management of, of my garden now, since I've implemented this strategy, it has made my soil so much better. It's made the plants far more vibrant and it's 
is a much easier task to actually to manage and, and get really good compost happening simply. So the first one I wanted to talk about is the idea of a, a com I call it a compost tractor based on that idea of the chicken tractor where you actually move the chickens from place to place around your garden and they do the scratching and the manuring and then you follow them round with a garden on the top of that. So it's kind of taken from that thread so it's not actually a tractor as you will see. It's a very simple idea and the simplicity of it I, I absolutely love because it works so well. So essentially what you do is most of us have these compost bins. You can see one sitting there in the garden. The compost bin is placed in a spot where the soil needs a really good replenishment and you know that there's been a whole lot of plant activity happening there and a lot of nutrients being drawn out of the soil and it's time. It needs a really good replenishment. So this is where you place your compost bin and you fill it up and you allow it to settle and once it's pretty much almost composted you simply lift off the bin spread out the compost in situ and then do a no dig garden over the top of that and then plant into that and then move your bin to a new location that needs um, replenishing so it might be up in between the fruit trees and then back down into the the perennial garden area or across into the herb garden into the middle of you know an annual veggie spot it can keep moving and you can actually have many different compost tractors all around and you just keep filling them up with your food scraps from your home with um, garden scraps from around some grasses and hay and all different sorts of things can go into this to keep feeding that soil the other thing that i really love about this system is that what's happening underneath is that all the all the material and if from the compost is actually creating this great big plume of activity and life and and nutrient enrichment in and around there so it's activating not just the spot where your compost bin is but it reaches out much much further and so you're essentially it's like an acupuncture point you're kind of activating from that point and rippling out an aliveness in the soil there so this is a really great way and a simple way all you have to do then is you're only ever carrying the bucket to fill each day or every few days whenever it is that you're putting your materials into the bin and then lifting off the bin and moving the, the bin, not the, the heavy compost, to different places. That you just sort of push over, mulch over the top, and, and there you go. And so this is some of the compost you can see that is ready to spread. And it's full of life and nutrients and organic matter. And as I said, the area around is activated too. Quite often, I don't bother to wait until it's fully and absolutely composted. Um, as long as it's you know relatively composted and most of the materials are sort of dissipating all of the extra materials are just going to add extra food into the soil and extra organic matter anyway so as long as it's on its way and it's lost most of its heat that's a really good time to to spread it out and get ready to go the second in situ compost system that i wanted to talk about is the worm tower so the worm tower is essentially a pipe that's embedded into the soil. And as you can see in the diagram, I generally dig a hole that's about 30 to 40 centimeters deep and bury this part. So it's empty and it's, a, it's open at the bottom and I drill holes through the pipe so that the worms can come and go into in and out of that pipe and but all of the holes are below the surface of the soil. So you're not going to get other things coming in. It's, it's really just about the worms. Now on the top, I allow the, the tube to come quite up high in my garden, although some people prefer to chop it off right down low so that you barely ever see it. But sometimes, you know, in a really big garden, you can lose them and forget about where they are. So I quite like the fact that it's visible and it's a reminder, okay, today I'll put the, the um, food scraps into this worm farm and then tomorrow I might go and put it into the compost tractor and then another day I might come around to another worm tower somewhere else. So I have worm towers scattered throughout the garden and I leave them there permanently. These ones actually don't move. These are in places where I know I have perennial gardens that are continuing and they need to be fed and so this is one way of doing that. So let me just explain a bit about how it works. So uh, I grab about a meter length of pipe I drill the holes in the bottom 30 to 40 centimeters of it. 
I dig a hole and I place it in. And inside that hole, I put in some bedding material for the worms. These are compost worms, so we're not relying on the earthworms will find their way in these. We actually want the compost worms in here because we want them to be eating the food scraps and the coffee grounds and all the materials that you're going to be putting in. It's like you're having a worm farm, but in the garden. Now, there's a lot of benefits from this because the liquid that comes out of a normal worm farm is going directly into this garden and being drawn out by a whole range of different um, creatures in the soil and taken to various places. So again, this one, the plume of activation is, is so much broader than where this actual worm tower is located. So what I do is I have a little lid on the top, which is like a pot you can see in the picture next door. And I lift that off and I put in my food scraps and always put a handful of of mulch in on the top too. It just helps to prevent any flies or other things going in. You can see that I always put a pot that's got holes so that some breathing um, can happen. I've seen some diagrams where there are um, old pot lids put on the top, um, you know, like saucepan lids, but I don't think that the, that the worm farm can breathe well enough if you do that. You still need to have the air holes. So I really like um, having the hot, just a simple pot upturned on the top. Now you can fill this all the way up to the top if you like and just monitor it and allow the worms to, during the day, they'll probably stay down in the soil. It's nice and cool for them there. Worms don't like the heat and they don't like the light. Um, so it's going to be dark inside there, but they don't like it too hot. But at night time, they can find their way up into this area and work their way through the materials and gradually you'll see it start to sink down and you know when it starts to move this life this activity the worms are really starting to process that and you can keep adding materials on top of this and this is why I find it's a good idea to have a few going on because if you just have the one it's I'm pretty sure you'll end, end up finding that you'll be starting to cram material into it you this is something that you really want to try and avoid. If you start to cram material in, you lose the spaces, the air holes, the openness that the worms will find their way up into and you just end up with a rotting mess of food scraps. So it's just lightly tipping them in and just keeping your, your, uh, your hay on the top of that. If you like, you could possibly even just add it on top of the hay and add some more um, grassy material, leafy material or you know, dry leaves on top. So you, you're getting a mixture of the carbon and nitrogen or even ripped up paper. Now I toss a whole lot of different things into here. Um, I don't typically use paper toweling, but if there is anything that comes into the house, like a paper toweling material or envelopes or some, you know, I get some newspaper from somewhere, I might rip that up and shred it in. I also put in um, clothing material that's just gone way too far and is not actually usable or fixable anymore. Anything that's a, a cotton based or natural fiber material, I'll pop in there and the worms will um, decompose that as well. Um, if you had any uh, cardboard, egg cartons, for example, anything that is biodegradable, you can actually put into these materials. So it's a fantastic way to try and actually reduce the waste that you're throwing out and returning much of it back into your soil. So what you'll notice, you need to have, start, as I mentioned before, start with some bedding and that could be some cocoa peat or a handful of compost or just something nice for the worms to get started in that's their base home. And you need to add in a really good big handful of worms to get you started. And then just gently add in materials until they start to activate. Um, don't sort of fill it up all in one go and, and expect that they're going to work through it. Uh, so this is something that you want to be starting to do. It Not obviously if you're in a snowy area um, to put in um, once the, the soil starts to warm up a little bit. Now if you are in one of those environments you might actually need to, to take it out over the winter time. Where I live in the subtropics and even in um, sort of temperate environments, these things can be left all year round and be utilized all year round. So I find uh, the worm farm is an incredibly useful uh, tool to activate the soil, um, to keep the soil alive, to feed the plants, to process so much of my food scraps. 
Um, and what, what you see after a while, this is a handful of the compost that I just dug out then. It's been a really, really dry. We're in drought here at the moment. And even though we are in drought, if you look down inside the holes and you pull it out, you can see that it's still alive and thriving and, and beautifully rich in under there. I can start to see some little ant um, babies in there too, the little white ones, which means that um, that's an indicator that it is a little bit dry, So, which is obvious um, in, in this environment at the moment because everything is just so parched dry. But I'm really happy to see that there's still thriving amounts. That was just one handful I grabbed out. Huge amounts of worms just thriving in there and you can see that with that big thick band around the belly of the the worm that then mature worms and they're going to start to be now that we're getting more moisture in we had a big rain last night um, they're going to start to be breeding up and and reactivating again after the winter so you can also see in there there's some roots so the plants are starting to send some roots into that spot um, it's really a very rich and alive environment. So keep feeding it, constantly feed the worms. It's a living system, that worm tower. Now, the plastic piping that you, that is used there, um, it's a different type of plastic and it doesn't leach into the soil. However, if you'd prefer to use something like a, a ceramic pot, um, a ceramic pipe or a ceramic pot that's also totally fine just remember to make sure that you have the holes going out the side so the worms can easily move in and out now the interesting thing is that the compost worms don't really venture very far from these pipes essentially they stay in this rich environment their their habitat is where there's all the food that they want to be um, eating there's other worms that will come in from the side and take the materials out further so it starts to become this whole collective and collaborative approach to improving your soil simply by installing these in so that's the worm <clears throat> excuse me that's the worm tower another way to really build up compost in situ is to do chop and drop now this is very much about looking at how nature creates compost if you look in in a natural system, as I mentioned before, basically it's just the materials that the plants are shedding to the soil below and the build up of that and the activation of the soil organisms as they come up and, and grab that and draw it down into the soil, that's creating soil right there and then. So if you allow a series of plants to grow in and around that you can chop and drop regularly. So um, behind the compost bin you can see a big area of comfrey so it's at this point I come in and I chop and I drop that comfrey right back and put it in and around underneath the trees I also use the pumpkin leaves as a chop and drop material as well so comfrey is a really great plant to help you get started um, with your chop and drop it grows fast all you need is a little section of root about the the thickness of your thumb and about the length of your thumb is a good indicator of what I would use as a minimum size of a of a of a root cutting for a comfrey and you just plug that into the soil somewhere where you're not going to dig and uh, essentially that's really important because um, comfrey roots propagate really easily and if you're going to be doing digging you can be chopping up the roots and then getting more plants than you want I find it really easy to manage if I do get a plant where I don't want it I simply sheet mulch over the top meaning I put a thick layer of newspaper and some mulch on the top and that will just it will just rot back down into the soil and improve the soil there so I don't find comfrey a problem in that way but I do actually spend a lot of time in establishing new gardens putting comfrey all around the edges, around, you know, um, fruit trees and uh, along the edges of gardens that can help to hold the mulch back to. And then I'm constantly chopping and dropping as my first form because this is one of the quickest plants to get a good amount of leafy matter. It drives its roots, its thick roots, deep down into the soil, bringing up nutrients. And so it's a really good activator and soil opener. And even if you didn't do the chop and drop and you just naturally allowed the leaves 
to die in situ and that you know as it new leaves come up the the lower ones sort of rot back down into the soil you will be improving the soil in and around that area and quite often I just come around and I grab the lower leaves that are dying off and just toss that around um, other places it's also a really good plant to put into a compost bin as well to help add and to activate your in situ uh, compost tractor bins another plant that I use to really help activate soils um, very rapidly and get a lot of organic matter to chop and drop a plants like edible canna, canna edulis. It too grows very fast, is very easy to grow um, and it produces a huge amount of leafy matter that when you chop and you drop it, it very rapidly breaks down into the soil, adds great organic matter and you can just keep chopping this plant and keep it um, it it comes back very rapidly and you chop and you drop and you chop and you drop. So when you're when you're pioneering your permaculture gardens, having plants like the comfrey and the canna are super useful, as are legume pioneer plants such as pigeon pea, which is this one here. Pigeon pea is a short-lived perennial shrub. Um, I've talked about this in previous masterclasses. It is actually a food plant too, as are comfrey and canna edulis uh, the you can see the the young pods forming here when they dry and go brown you can harvest the pigeon peas from inside this and this is what's used as dal in India anyway from a perspective of chopping and dropping we're we're focusing on the leaves the wonderful thing about pigeon pea leaves is they're very easy to harvest you can simply snap off branches. So you look at the tree and you look at where whereabouts on that plant. You could either coppice it or um, gently snap off or, or snip off some branches. And you can shred the leaves off just by running your hand down the stem. And the leaves just come off and you can just put that straight in on the soil. Or simply be... Um, pruning the plant regularly which which helps to keep it growing lots of new growth and keeping it looking good and healthy and simply just put the leaves and the branches directly on the soil in and around the plants that you're growing I often plant pioneer legumes first and when they've got established then I place fruit trees in and amongst those because it provides protection and habitat for young plants and it also provides that uh, the the um the soil improvement for the mulch but because these are legumes they're also helping to fix nitrogen in the soil so after four or five years when these plants die they're short-lived plants um, and you just kind of knock the plant back down in and chop it up and leave it in and around the soil on the roots the little nodules of nitrogen that have been collected over the time will start to act as slow release fertilizers fertilizers underneath the soil and be releasing materials back in but also the all oh, the root system that has developed on it will be rotting and breaking back down into the soil adding organic matter so pioneer legumes cannas and comfries and plants like these are enormously beneficial as chop and drop plants a couple of other things that I also do for chop and drop, um, for example, on the on the on the left, you can see there's um, pumpkin vines. In my in my garden, uh, I have self seeding pumpkins that come up, and I have an enormous amount of food, both from eating the leaves and the shoots and the and the pumpkin and the seeds and the skins and all those things. And then when it's finished, I pick it all up and I just toss it back down on the soil where it is and plant back through it and in some places um, have a sort of a transitioning garden that's going on so there'll be pumpkins at one time of the year and then when they're finished the sweet potatoes will start to come up through it and then grow over the top of it and so each crop is replenishing the soil for the next one and you can see on the right where the sweet potato has actually created a living mulch um, all over that area and so it's constantly I chop it and I put it back into the garden trim off the bits that are coming over the terrace and they get tossed back in um, underneath the fruit trees or added onto the the garden other garden areas so actually utilizing the surplus materials that grow from from a whole range of different sorts of vegetables to return these back into the soil um, is a really good idea which brings me to the uh, green manures 
So green manures are a really very, very useful strategy, um, not only in uh, small gardens, but also in broader scale areas where applying compost um, or manures is just too labor intensive and too costly for that matter. So green manures help to support healthy soils and the complex web of life. Um, so if your soil is drying out like cement or you've got sickly looking plants, essentially you need more life and these sorts of green manures can help support that too so they're annual fast growing crops typically there'll be um, a combination of legumes and, and grasses combined so you're building up your organic matter and your nitrogen in the soil to feed the soil life to protect the soil and to create habitat um, but also because you've got these living plants they're opening up the soil and and um, increasing the penetration potential for air and moisture and they're smothering weeds so it's a really good idea not to leave soil bare in a place but to keep if you have an area that you need to improve to start adding in some green manures so here's a, a bit of a selection of some of them that you might want to consider um, so mustard is a really useful one that propagates so these are plants that propagate really easily and if any of you have ever had mustard spinach seeding out through your garden you'll know how easy it is to grow this plant and from one seed you get thousands of seeds and then you can actually utilize this as a green manure so the idea with the green manures is is to really before they um fully flower and seed out through your garden is to chop and drop them back into the soil now some people choose to dig them in i tend to just chop and leave them on the top of the soil and allow the soil organisms to take them into the soil as they like so but i always do leave certain patches to go fully to seed because this means that i will then have um, seed that i can either collect and spread around where i want it or i can have self-seeding areas um, improving continuously and it's just these constant patches of improvement um, that are going on everywhere so mustard is one broad beans is another broad beans or fava beans fava greens is a, a, a huge amount of organic matter grows on these plants and i here in the subtropics I get very little bean off my broad beans mostly I grow it to eat the leafy greens but also as a as a crop in the cool times um, to actually improve the soil so these again I allow them to grow up until they're really nice and bushy and have a massive amount of leaf on them and then I chop and I drop them back and if you carefully do this you'll get a continuous a continuum of growth happening with these for quite some time until the plant is exhausted then you you know mulch over the top and then you have a new crop growing in that spot daikon radish is another one that has an enormous amount of leafy matter on top um, this is one of the plants that's recommended by fukuoka and he used it in his no dig um, farming system it has very big deep thick roots that really help to open up the soil but from a green manure perspective one of the things that that is really valuable is how much top material how much leafy green material there is so again you can be chopping and dropping and you can actually do this over time you don't need to wait until a certain point you can start to chop and drop and pull off materials off the side and as long as you've still got that growing tip growing um, in the center it will keep producing more and more materials over time now one of the plants that also is really useful and it's not a legume but it's a grass and having a grassy material is really helpful to bulk out the organic matter you know how we add mulch materials and hay and and grass hay actually grow your own have a patch of oats that you grow and enable um, your soil to be replenished by this so again you don't wait until it's fully seeded when it's at this stage thick and grassy you can just come in and chop and drop and lay it back on top of itself and allow it to keep doing that till it's exhausted and then mulch over the top and similarly um, buckwheat so buckwheat is a fantastic um, 
plant which has a lot of organic matter um, and it also if you do allow it to flower it attracts an enormous amount of beneficial insects into your garden and if you allow it to go full cycle you'll get a huge amount of food too and um, this buckwheat is a really valuable food um, that you can grow quite easily in your garden so again with all of these the idea as i said before is to grow them out have big patches of them in areas where you really need to replenish soil or grow them underneath some fruit trees for a while or have an area of your vegetable garden that needs a bit of a break from production and you really need to replenish it and and then you can um, get these happening so buckwheat and and clover um, cowpea cowpea is a very vigorous um, bean which you can is a really great for broad areas and and so is vetch Vetch I love to use in and around underneath orchards and as you can see here um, it has uh, a lot of flower which attracts beneficial insects. I actually tend to allow vetch to go beyond just being something that I chop and drop to into something that it becomes a living um, cover crop. So I allow it to keep on growing until it actually dies back in situ. So it's more of a longer term um, green manure in that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. A trench. Now, this is, you know, one of the oldest forms of compost that I know. I remember as a kid growing up in Ringwood and my um, my dad would, you know, dig a hole down the back near, near one of his fruit trees and bury the compost. And when that hole was full, he would move to another spot. And so over time, the backyard just kept getting improved and improved because the materials went straight into the soil right there where he needed them. So it's a simple idea. Basically, it's about digging a hole in the ground and covering it over. And there's, But I want to talk a little bit more about it because there's a few different things that you can do. One of the problems with just digging a hole and is about having things coming in and digging it up. So you want to be able to bury it deep enough so that it the smell of smell is not sort of come it's not obvious for say dogs or rats to sort of come in and spread out the material if you do have a really big problem with things digging up a trench compost however you may want to to cover it so perhaps with a you know like a big bread crate or a pallet that's weighted down um, enable you to actually leave that there and for long enough and for that for the decomposition to start happening so that other animals aren't coming digging up these sort of fresh food scraps and and uh, enjoying those so so essentially what you can do is if you have a new area that you're wanting to set up a garden in and you you're patient enough then you can um, create dig your trench so I, I would say you know maybe about 30 30 to 40 centimeters deep so you want to be able to have maybe 20 20 odd centimeters that is the food scraps and garden waste which is a, a combination of green and brown still so you know leafy greens and a few sticks to keep the aeration as well as ripped up papers and old bits of cardboard and cloths as well as the food scraps mix those in and then cover it over with probably about you know 15 to 20 centimeters of soil and mulch over the top so you just return the soil that's come from you know that you've dug out and put that on the top and uh and there there you have it that's it and after several months what you will find is that this has turned into a beautiful rich amazing spot where you can start to plant a new garden so some people actually when they're doing rows they might do a, a trench garden um, next to another row garden and then swap over that the the garden from before becomes the trench for next time and you can actually do this as strips between plants so if you have a, a larger section you have an, an orchard with a whole lot of plants growing you could dig a trench down beside them and keep filling it up I tend to just do um, just holes in different spots so if I see that there's some plants that are needing some help and on my slope what I tend to do is I dig the hole above and so this hole becomes almost like a swale for example in a different way because it's actually collecting moisture and it's also composting material simultaneously and this is going down into the soil in and around the root system of a plant and with the slope it's actually getting drawn down the hill 
um, to feed that whole plant. So I always have it above. If you're on a slope, if you're on flat ground, then really you can put it wherever you want. And maybe you can um, have one in one spot and then on the other side of the plant in another time. You can also sprinkle with things like rock dust to help with minerals and helping to maybe break up any clay pans if you if you have things uh, if you have really clay soil adding some gypsum. Um, another thing that you could do is actually sow a green manure on top of it. So then you have this amazingly lush amount of organic matter that is even better than it would have been before coming out of this area and so it's it's doubling your impact from that these are also places where you can be burying your bakashi compost so a bakashi compost is essentially you have a, a bucket in your <clears throat> in your kitchen and every time you put in some food scraps you sprinkle it you can see in this picture below you sprinkle it with a it's sort of like a rice husk or wheat husk that are activated with effective microorganisms. And essentially what it does is when you sprinkle it over and you push it down, it, it kind of pickles this material. It's a bit like doing a ferment and it pre-composts the materials. And you can put all different sorts of things. As you can see in here, there's avocados and there's paper and there's citrus and there's bread. And you can put dairy products and onion skins and all different sorts of things that you wouldn't normally put into your standard compost bin or recommended not to. I just put all that sort of thing into the Bakashi. The other thing about the Bakashi that I really love, and I'll mention just here now, is that it actually stops this bucket from smelling. So I can keep this bucket on my on my um, kitchen bench and lift the lid up, even on a really hot day, and it doesn't smell because it's it's activated. Some, something's different in it. It's changed its chemical structure so that it doesn't, it's not just like a whole lot of rotting food in a bucket. It is started to be a living system going on in there. So unlike a worm farm, when you put your food scraps into a worm farm, the worms are processing that and they turn it into that beautiful rich material and you get the liquid off the bottom. In a bakashi bin, it doesn't do that. If you if you leave that bucket for six months and open up the lid, you will still see the bread and the avocado and the citrus, but it there will be different. There com there will be changed. Uh, so what what um you can't just leave it and on a veranda and expect to actually get compost material from a bakashi bucket to use in your small scale system. Uh, you need to be able to bury this material. And this is when it activates the soil and becomes compost really rapidly. So it helps you to get your trench composting happening even quicker. So as soon as it's in the ground, it really activates things a lot more. So this may be something you can do in combination, having the, the Bakashi uh, system in combination with your trench gardening or your burying of your compost. Um, so, you know, this just a simple bearing is a brilliant way of, of getting your composting happening really easily and activating the soil organisms. Um, and if you combine it with your bakashi and you combine it with your um, green manures or you add chop and drop on the top, all of those things together will really help. And it's such a simple thing to do. So just in summary, um, the five different methods that I've been talking about today uh, one, the compost tractor, actually having the bin and moving it around the site. And this way you can actually collect a bulk amount of material and prepare for a no-dig garden in a particular area. And, and this is what I use it predominantly for, is for preparing an area for a new no-dig or a replenished no-dig. The worm tower allows me to feed directly into areas where I've got perennial gardens in the in quite often in, in my um, vegetable garden, but the perennial vegetable garden. So it's this constant feeding for the constant plant growing. Chop and drop is um, growing your own mulch and growing material is going to be feeding the soil and a continual supply of your own greens and browns on site. And I typically like to think about growing maybe about 30% of the things that I grow can be chopped and dropped back into the soil at least. Then um, green manures actually growing plants particularly for building up organic matter and to feed the soil um, so these are your, your annual legumes and your annual grasses which are fast activating fast growing and fast activating your soil 
And the final one was the trench system, about burying it and maybe combining that too with the green manures and with things like Bokashi. So I hope there's something in all of those different systems that you feel that you perhaps are doing some or all of these already and that's fantastic. Maybe there's one of these you're doing and maybe you could tweak a little bit or add another different one. But I really love this idea of actually having compost systems and compost thinking across your whole site. So your zone one garden, your zone two garden, your zone three garden, your zone four systems. All of your systems have different sorts of compost systems going on and that enable you to really do the composting where you need it and that it's happening all the time because too often you know you end up you, you come to somewhere and you see people's gardens and their compost system is stuck at the far end and it requires turning and, and maintenance and it doesn't happen because people get their busy lives and you end up with you know, rotting messes of things. This way, you can directly turn your food scraps very easily and very quickly and your garden scraps directly into your soil and let the soil organisms do the work for you. So it's a, it's a really smart way of doing your compost. It's a simple way of doing your compost and it makes it accessible um, to so many more people to do it as well. So really, in this way, you shouldn't really need to have to import extra materials once you get these sorts of things really thriving. So just once again, I wanted to mention uh, that the registration is now open for uh, my permaculture teacher training program. Um, it is a combination of a permaculture design certificate course and a permaculture teacher certificate course. It's online, all online. It's self-paced. You do it in your place and you can register anytime. There's an international community of practice which is really active and very supportive and a wonderful group of people who are designing their own places and starting already to teach um, even before they're finished, starting to practice their teaching in their schools and in their communities. And it's, it's a, it's, as a teacher, this has been a fantastic um, opportunity to connect with so many people. I've been teaching permaculture for 25 years in about 20 different countries, and always it's been face to face. So this is the first time that I've been teaching permaculture design certificate courses online, and I've added and created the permaculture teacher certificate so that it's a really fantastic way to actually not only become a permaculture designer, but to create a livelihood out of doing this too because I really do believe that in order for us to be able to to make the changes we need in this world we need to not just have our hobbies in something like this it's our livelihood it's our way of life it's our work as well and if we can help to ripple that out and make changes in our communities and to help teach younger people and help help others to also create their livelihood in this it can only be a beneficial thing in my mind so check out the program on permacultureeducationinstitute.org. Um, if you have any questions, you're very welcome to email me on morag at permacultureeducationinstitute.org. And I really do look forward to inviting you and welcoming you into the course. So thank you again for listening and attending this masterclass. I will be putting up a poll very soon uh, for you to vote on the next topic for the masterclass which is happening in September on the 24th so again it will be a Monday night at 8 p.m Brisbane time and if you are watching this after the after the date remember that you are very welcome to register for this and I will send you the the link afterwards but the benefit of being here present at the actual masterclass time means that I will be online answering questions continuously through this masterclass uh, so that you, if you have questions about something that pops up, you can ask me directly right there and then. And um, I really love that interaction and that opportunity to, even though we're online and we're in all in our different homes and our, all our different places, we can actually still have a fantastic opportunity to, to learn from one another. So also, if you have things that references and resources that you know that you feel are valuable to share, I encourage you to put them up too. So thank you again. Um, if you'd like to stick around and, and add a few extra questions in now, I'll be here for the next 10 minutes. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you and, and good night or good morning, wherever you might be uh, listening to this. Um, it's Maura Gamble from the Permaculture Education Institute.